Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending the first of six lectures in our series amid a pandemic 1521 to 2021. Uh, my name is Rachel Strahan Navarro, and I am one of two academic coordinators at the Art, Design, and Architecture Museum at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I'm going to try to keep this short, but I have some important information and housekeeping items to share with you before we begin our discussion. Um, first, the Art, Design, and Architecture Museum acknowledges and honors the coastal Chumash people, the traditional custodians of the land where UCSB now stands. We pay our respects to the Chumash elders past, present, and future, for they hold the memories, the traditions, and the culture of this area, which has become a place of learning for people from all over the world. And as we have many attendees from places other than Santa Barbara, and many of us are working in places near and far away from campus, I invite you to take a few moments later today to learn about the traditional custodians of the land you are currently occupying. For our roundtable discussion today, we have four panelists to discuss this landmark anniversary the ways in which we are linked from 2021 to 1521, and the ways in which artists, including historical Aztec scribes and now Sandy Rodriguez, can help us confront and make sense of all it implies. First, Celia Rodriguez is a painter, performance and installation artist whose work reflects a full generation of dialogue with Chicano, Native American, pre-Columbian, and Mexican thought. She is the co-founder and the co-director of Las Maestras Center for Chicana Indigenous Thought, Art, and Social Practice at UCSB, where she also teaches Chicanax art, history, and studio practice in the Department of Chicano and Chicana Studies. Felicia Rhapsody Lopez constructs methods for the decipherment of glyphic indigenous texts of Central Mexico. Her work decolonizes contemporary understandings of texts by and about indigenous people. As an assistant professor of literature, languages, and cultures at the University of California, Merced, her scholarship builds bridges across disciplinary lines and between diverse ancient and modern cultures. A builder of bridges and a teller of stories, Felicia continues ancient indigenous artistic and cultural traditions in order to make these indigenous epistemologies accessible to diverse heritage populations today. Allison Kaplan is an assistant professor in the Department of History of Art and Architecture at UCSB. She is a specialist in the art of late post-classic and early colonial Mexico, and her research focuses on indigenous Nahuatl aesthetics and art history, and the relationship between visual and verbal expression in the Nahuatl language. Kaplan received her PhD and master's in art history and Latin American studies from Tulane University and her bachelor's in comparative literature and society from Columbia University. Maria Lumbreras is an assistant professor, is also an assistant professor in the Department of History and Art and Architecture here at UCSB. A specialist in early modern Iberian art and visual culture, her research looks at the intersections between art, science, and archaeology in Habsburg, Spain with a particular interest in the intertwined histories of knowledge and ignorance. She is currently working on her first book, which looks at the history of Iberian antiquarianism from the point of view of its fascination with the frailties of human knowledge, one of the many challenging legacies of Spain's multi-confessional past. Lumbreras received her PhD from John Hopkins University and her master's and bachelor's from the Universidad Autónoma in Madrid. Her research has been supported by the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, the Singleton Center for the Study of Pre-Modern Europe, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and Harvard University. And Maria has kindly uh, accepted the um, role of moderating this conversation, so I will go ahead and um, turn it over to you, Maria, and let you um, begin the conversation. Um. Thank you, Rachel, uh, for the kind introduction. And thank you to you and the museum and everyone ha who has been working uh, to put this um, series together and to bring us all here today. Um, it's, it's wonderful to, to be part of this. I guess I'm gonna start with a disclaimer. Um, when we began talking about the Rusty's Roundtable, I jumped at the opportunity 
of acting as a moderator, um, or at least as something a key, more akin to a moderator than a speaker. And this was for reasons that were central to where I think we hope the discussion would contribute, which of course has as much to do with the cataclysmic events um, in and around 1521 as with our current moment. Um, these are reasons that have to do in particular with the way in which our interpretative frameworks, interests, and political commitments as a scholar have changed over the past decade, in looking back at Tenochtitlan at that precise time, a time when after two years of massacres, the Spanish finally invaded the city all as an epidemic began in the fall of 1520, ravaged the city's indigenous population. And not surprisingly, um, the first question that we all thought made sense to open the discussion um, was how some this exhibition can also be seen as an intervention in this way. So I'm hoping to um, leave the stage to my um, colleagues. And I wanted to ask you to hear your thoughts um, about why you think it is significant that this exhibition is happening now in 2021. Well, I guess I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, the signs that were there, they've been on, all around us now for some years, you know, uh, bringing us to this moment. And the elders have always spoken about these times coming. But of course, you know, time is relative. And when you're young, you know, time looks immediate um, and at the same time distant. And so here we are in the times that the elders California native elders in particular, and other elders of other nations have been speaking to us of um, this, uh, the reflection of this time then for us as human beings, um, living historical lives now, looking back and finding the common, the commonalities. And of course, the artists, you know, are, are in a sense, you know, they're sensitive, right? That things come to you from all senses. And so I, I think that the that um, it just makes sense that, the, that we respond at this moment and see the reverberation and reflections of, of um, you know, what has been happening, not what happened, but what has been happening over 500 years. Yeah, I think uh, in some ways, I mean, sort of a, a um, simpler answer to this question would be that we're really, we're sort of thinking about this 500 year mark, right, out from 1521. And I think what Sandy's work in particular and this exhibition are doing that I think also really sort of dovetail really nicely with what Celia was talking about is actually really invite us to think specifically about the relationship between this year 2021 and this year 1521. And think about ways in which the events that were happening in 1521 in terms of this major sort of impulse to the colonial project in the Americas has really fundamentally marked the reality that we're living today. Um, so I think really kind of paying attention to um, ways in which this is a historical event, but it's also one that's really present with us in a lot of different ways is really fundamental to this exhibition and sort of the conversation that I think we wanna have around it. And I'm just going to uh, just to agree, just agree with everything that's been said already um, by Celia and, and Allison. Uh, I think that you know I, I think a lot of people in the in the popular conception see 1521 as this this marker, this big end, and really it wasn't a big end. It was a it was a time of of major shift, and I think we're still living in a lot of ways in a time of major political and cultural shift. Right? We still see colonization, it just exists in a different way. We still see the, the oppression and discrimination against indigenous populations. We just see it manifesting in a very different way. Uh, and we can still see, we see really wonderful, beautiful examples of resistance and survivance coming out of 1521. And there's been an absolute continuation of that to the present day. And I think this art exhibit is a really wonderful example of the ways that artists have continued to resist and reflect in a way that's true to indigenous epistemologies. And so I'm really thankful to be part of this, uh, of this panel today. Um, I couldn't, I think I couldn't agree more uh, with what you all said. And something that for me is excited about having you here specifically is that um, those changes uh, in the way we understand this history had a lot to do with the kind of work 
um, that we are able, or that we hope to be able to do today. Uh, and it has to do a lot with, with changes also in our approaches. Um, and so it, it made me think a lot um, about how this is different in thinking about 1521 and 2021 to, for instance, um, how these anniversaries are, are um, had happened and specifically what happened in 1992 also. Um, um, because on the one hand, um, it was a moment in which, for instance, you would find an exhibition like Circa 1942 at the National Gallery in Washington, in a way celebrating and it is in its, in its title, The Exploration, but it's also a moment that had the, the witness protest and the witness other kinds of landmark publications, for instance, I'm thinking of Elizabeth Hilburn, um, Hilburn's volume, Native Traditions of the Post-Conquest World, um, or Walter Mignolo's The Darker Side of the Renaissance. So what do you think make, um, make this different in terms of, of how, we, how our current understanding of this history um, is and, and how it matters? Yeah, so I, I will start us off, but I'd love to hear my co-panelists' thoughts on this too. Um, I think 1992 in a lot of ways was sort of a moment of uh, really intense debate around what the legacy of 1492 with Columbus's arrival in the Caribbean um, sort of meant and the ways in which we wanted to name it and also narrate it in the present moment. So we see sort of a lot of different ways of commemorating that 500 year anniversary. So, um, you know, scholarly publications are one, but we also have a lot of um, uh, sort of artistic production, particularly by Chicanx uh, artists who are actually starting to really draw on this codex tradition that we see Sandy working with in her exhibition. Um, and you know, really sort of intensely debating this question of whether this is a discovery, right? This is sort of a major question that um, I think uh, different people are taking different stances on in 1992. Um, you know, we're, I guess, 29 years out from that, and we're talking about this um, later event of 1521. Um, but I, I think, you know, we're dealing with similar questions, I think, of sort of terminologies and ways in which we maybe want to revise those terminologies. So this is an event that historically a, a lot of scholars in particular, um, but also coming out of the 16th century, writers are referring to as the conquest, right? Um, I, I think there's been a move uh, since 1992 to sort of think about this as a military engagement and invasion um, and really to kind of push back on this narrative of a conquest um, that really in a lot of ways just perpetuates the your, uh, ideologies that we have coming out of the 16th century um, and particularly European authors who are writing about these events. Um, so I think in a lot of ways we're sort of continuing questions that were coming up in 1992 but I think there are sort of different vantages that we have on those questions. But I would love to hear what Felicia and Celia have to, have to say about this. Yeah, uh, you know, I'll say that uh, I, I, I remember 1992, and I wasn't a scholar at the time, um, but it certainly was a very different kind of political moment that we were living at that time. And so I think that while we have seen a trajectory for quite some time where there's been a, a, a resurgence and a, like a revitalization of uh, a, you know, reclaiming and restoring in, indigenous knowledge and uh, indigenous um, cultural elements that were destroyed, that were, that were banned, that were barred, uh, while there's been that reclamation going on for quite some time, we've seen it much more, I think, since, since 1992. Uh, and so what I see happening uh, since, that, since that time period is that we see a lot more push back, a lot more push towards things like decolonizing uh, our ways of thinking about, about uh, you know, not just, not just our contemporary world, but the indigenous worlds that were existing before the arrival of the Europeans. Uh, because so much of what we, what we believe within popular culture and even within academic circles about uh, about indigenous cultures, specifically the Aztecs, is that they were very, very warlike, very, very, uh, you know, militaristic, patriarchal. Uh, and so those kinds of records that we're getting 
about the Aztec uh, people is largely coming from Spanish men who are who are painting the picture in a very specific way. And so since I've seen in the scholarship since 1992, we see a, a major upshoot of scholars who are trying to really decolonize, to try to, try to look at, at gender issues a very different way, gender representations a different way, uh, the ways that Europeans and, and the conquistador specifically have painted the people in very specific and very harmful ways and how that has perpetuated over the last 500 plus years, these stereotypes, right? And they've really influenced the way indigenous people uh, and mixed indigenous people, heritage populations are still seen today. Uh, and so as much as we can, we can kind of combat those things, I think we're very much living in a time where this is something that is important to, you know, not just, not just the scholars in, in this field, but to people on the ground, right? To, to our, our young undergrads, our graduate students are really invested in social justice. And a big part of that is really bringing those voices back. Um, and we see, you know, we see a complete loss of, of women writers in colonial era um, because of the patriarchal practices of, of the Spanish, uh, of the Spanish con conquerors and the clergy, right? So women aren't allowed to be educated at all. And so we had women writers before, much in the tradition of Sandy Rodriguez, and those women were completely uh, locked out of those traditions. And so it's just a wonderful thing that since 1992, we've seen an upswing of that. We see much more reclamation of that uh, and much more of a push towards, uh, towards uh, being true and decolonizing a lot of the records that we've seen. And I think part of that practice, I mean, I, I feel like I have to, you know, I look at uh, 1992 and I think of the outcome of the um, women of color feminist um, you know, movements. Um, I think of the International Treaty Council. Um, I think of the, you know, the, that work that brought us to, uh, to the permanent forum on indigenous issues, the Zapatista, um, you know, movements. Um, but then also there are those uh, traditional peoples moving back and forth across, um, you know, Northern, Southern uh, indigenous territories through that colonial border all of those people coming together ceremonially and politically um, really makes an impact, I think, in 1992, when you think about um, the work of people like Irena uh, Cervantes or uh, Jalea Senajani or um, Guillermo Gomez Peña. I mean, all of those folks who begin to think uh, and respond to the idea of continuity, you know, that uh, we are, that there is an, a, a, a policy in terms of how indigenous peoples are treated and looked at, and particularly Chicanos, Chicanas, Chicanex, and uh, and then the response of the artists, the writers, and the and the uh, the painters, the performance artists, you know, who begin to have a conversation that is not really about the colonial borders, but what is you know what lays underneath, and is still very much alive, you know, so. I think 92, uh, you know, kind of pushes us toward this moment, right, where a lot of things that have been happening in resistance begin to come together um, in terms of looking at movement, you know, uh, whether it's artistic and written movement and, you know, and the undercurrents of the, of the current politics. Um, going back to what you were just um, saying, uh, Celia, about um, movement and borders um, and this artistic participation in movements that I think puts Sandy's work so well in context because she she is really drawing on on on, on this context um, and you can see a dialogue happening. Um, and partly it has to do with I think all of you refer to these these um, asymmetries of power that um, we can see in the colonial period that, that persists in so many ways today. And, and so um, there is an interest to me in this in these question of, um, I guess because I work in ignorance on of, of how much um, we have learned not to see about these asymmetries, which is something we are re reckoning uh, with right now. But it also pushes for me uh, the question um, of what are the sources 
that we have and how we can critically address them in order to open other avenues for research. And of course, this brings me back to Sandy and the kind of uh, manuscripts and codexes from this time, Tenas um, Chitlin, uh, um, in the first decade of the 16th century. Um, I was wondering if you could talk, it would be interesting uh, if we could talk a little bit about um, what the sources are, which, um, how do you work with them really, and how Sandy's work is also bringing them into life within this, this context of artistic practice today between Mexico and California. Ah, yes, it's my turn to begin. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, we, we uh, unfortunately, of course, there was a, a major loss of, uh, of sources uh, of uh, records. Uh, there was intentional destruction of nearly all the writing that we have from Mesoamerica. And, you know, we're, we're, we're fortunate because we have, we have written records from Mesoamerica where, that were lacking from a lot of other uh, areas throughout the Americas. Um, but you know, depending on which, which record you're looking at, some were saying that there were libraries filled of, of books of these, of these uh, codices that we call, as we call them today. Uh, and now we have, we have very minimal texts, uh, you know, arguably there's, a, you know, there's some debate, but around 16 texts that we have that are coming from prior to the arrival of the Europeans, we have, we have much more documentation coming from the early colonial period. Uh, and then we have a, a, a actually millions of documents written in Nahuatl uh, from, uh, you know, from various census records and things like that. Uh, things that are a little bit drier and, uh, and tell us very specific things about lived experience. Um, but in terms of the, the pre-contact ways of life, um, those, those texts are relatively rare. Uh, now, um, I think people are relatively familiar with Mayan writing, Mayan texts, uh, the, the decipherment that's been done with, with those texts. Uh, and we have, um, we have glyphs that are carved into monuments and, uh, and, and these kinds of things. Um, there's less, there's been less work, unfortunately, uh, done with Aztec representations and uh, Central Mexican texts. Um, and so there's actually been quite a bit of scholarly debate about whether or not these texts are a true form of writing or whether they're just picture books um, or like comic books. Uh, and I'm on the side of them being absolutely a form of writing uh, and that they're logographic and that they just are much harder to decipher than the Mayan texts. Um, but we have these texts and they're minimal <laughs> and they're very difficult to decipher. And then we have, we have uh, you know, other texts that were created in the colonial period, many of which were destroyed. Um, you know, um, the, the content was very limited in terms of what, what people were allowed to write about. We have these alphabetic texts, uh, again, that were very limited and often, oftentimes written under the guidance of, of Spanish uh, supervisors. Um, and so there was a lot of control there in terms of what could or couldn't be written about. Uh, and then of course we have uh, living texts, we have cultures, we have, uh, we have communities that have maintained traditions. Uh, and you know, I, I think that those are just as valid um, they won't necessarily tell us exactly, you know, <laughs> it's not going to be like, like a, a written text that we can decipher that's, that's 500 years old, um, but they can tell us quite a bit about the continuation of these cultures and beliefs and traditions. So this is a different kind of text, in my opinion, but it's still a text. Yeah, I think um, building off of what Felicia is saying, um, so in terms of sort of the way that historians have written this history, um, we have a really long period of really like no engagement with the body of sources that Felicia was talking about, right? So we have a really long historical period in which historians are really just working with documents that are being written in European languages. So for this, for this region we're talking about, these are primarily sources that are written in Spanish. Um, so we have in particular mendicant friars who come uh, very sort of soon after um, this event in 1521 that we're talking about. 
and settle in central Mexico and then sort of expand out. Um, and they're producing documents that we uh, often refer to as cronicas or chronicles, um, which are really sort of Spanish language descriptions of indigenous peoples um, who they're interacting with. Simultaneous with this type of production, though, we also have the production in indigenous languages of documents that are being written in the early colonial period and that are being written using the Roman alphabet. So this is um, sort of a little background to what Felicia was saying for those who don't know. So we have an existing uh, glyphic writing system for central Mexico. We have sort of parallel ones. Uh, the Maya, as Felicia is pointing out, is maybe the most famous. Um, but we have these different write, uh, writing systems, which primarily we're seeing actually in these codices that we're talking about, um, but which we also see in uh, stone sculpture, uh, various different media. Um, during the early colonial period, there's an effort that is largely dri driven by these mendicant friars to um, uh, develop an, a Roman alphabet that is sort of adapted to indigenous languages. And the Nahuatl language, which is sort of a lingua franca for, um, for this region of Mexico during this time period, and which actually sort of expands its geographical reach across Mexico um, during the colonial period, this becomes sort of a first language that um, Mendicant friars are sort of trying to render in Roman alphabet. Um, this, though, uh, alphabetic writing of indigenous languages really becomes sort of a major area of production. So we have, uh, yeah, I think thousands is a good estimate um, of documents that are written um, in Nahuatl, but, you know, also Mixtec, Zapotec, right? We have, we have sort of a lot of different indigenous languages that are being um, used to produce these types of documents. Um, in the one, on the one hand, we have documents that are produced that are sort of part of uh, the everyday functioning of the colonial state in Mexico. So these are, this is sort of one set of documents that we can use to understand what was happening and what daily life looked like under colonial rule in Mexico. Um, we also though, have a really important body of writings, which are histories of these events of 1519 to 1521 that are written in Nahuatl. And a really important one, and one that Sandy actually sort of draws from directly um, in her work, is from this work that's known as the Florentine Codex, or the General History of the Things of New Spain, is sort of our longer title. Um, and this is a work that's written in Nahuatl that's in 12 books. It deals with a lot of different topics of Nahuatl culture and thought. Um, but book 12 is, in particular, a history of these events. And so we're actually getting a description that's written in the mid 16th century of these events. And um, we get actually a really different perspective on what was happening um, and sort of how it was being understood. So as uh, coming back to the beginning of this answer, right? Um, as we're shifting from sort of exclusively using these Spanish language sources to tell this history, and we're actually engaging with writings that uh, Nahua people in the 16th century were writing about these events, our understanding of these events really has shifted. So this is, I think, a process that is ongoing. Um, I think sort of building like broader uh, expertise among scholars in indigenous languages is a really important push to actually sort of engaging with these writings um, as a major way of understanding and knowing these historical events. Um, but I would say this is sort of one of these major shifts that we want to think about in terms of the ways in which we've narrated these historical events. Yeah, and if I can just chime in, I, I want to give Celia her, her chance to re reply as well, but I want to chime in and just say that uh, Allison and I know each other, and the way that we know each other is through learning Nahuatl. And so, uh, you know, I think this is a really important thing that, that thankfully more and more scholars that are coming through are really taking seriously, uh, because uh, unfortunately, uh, in, if we're looking at academics, uh, the scholars within the field, uh, not a large percentage of them have really endeavored in the task of getting to know the, in, the languages of the indigenous people that they're focusing on. Uh, and so this has been, a, yeah, as Allison was saying, a very important and much needed shift. Go ahead, Sarah Seven. No, it's fine. Um, I think I want to in, interrupt the colonial perspective a little bit because I think that that's one of the biggest impact we've had 
at least you know, speaking from this particular continent, is how we see particular things, how we see, how we understand what writing is, how we understand what documentation is. You know, and so there's a, there's a way in which when I was a, a young artist, I, I didn't want to read the interpretation. I didn't want to read the, um, the way that the, uh, that the language had been, had shifted even ever slightly from the image to Roman alphabet. And it's interesting, I was in, a, I did a, a performance piece in, I think it was, where was I? Um, yeah, Eastern, it was um, Amsterdam, no. Oh, my brain is going to go. <laughs> it was um, it was a piece that I was asked to do, and I did some research on the area, and found that um, that people kept telling me this is in Europe kept telling me that there was nothing there before Christianity, there was nothing to see before Christianity. Brussels, that's where we were, and so I did the research on Brussels and and found my way past Christianity. Um, and everybody kept saying to me, no, it wasn't really responding to, to the culture. It was all these tribal peoples coming back and forth. And I realized how long, you know, the colonial occupation had existed in that area, that you can lose a sense of human endeavor, you know, and sort of locate it, you know, at a moment when, um, when thought and uh, was considered uh, to only exist in written form, you know, and contained in written form which already has, you know, um, a particular um, meaning and a loss of meaning. And so I think here, um, one of the aspects that I saw in Sandy's work that really mattered to me, uh, you know, in terms of our Chicana Politica, what I think of as a Chicana Indigenous Politica, is the actual um, idea of recovery. And, and, we, and recovery is such, you know, it's a word that we all, that we all think about because recovery also means becoming, becoming awake, you know, waking up um, to the idea that, that uh, the spirit of things are still there. And even our language, you know, which is difficult, the idea of thing, object, artifact, you know, is again a colonial vision of, of what it means, of what human production is in terms of its own, having its own, uh, vibration and aliveness and spirit. So I look at Sandy's work and the act of making the work, the material that she chooses, the reason I work with watercolor pigment, uh, but looking at her work with amate, with mineral, plant, resin, you know, those are, it, it's, a, it's a, a, a relationship then that indigenous people here have always claimed is a dual, it's a, it's a relationship that goes both ways. It has a spiritual knowledge that gets released when you use it. And, and the artisan becomes the listener because the material itself begins to tell you something about itself and begins to document the moment. That embodiment as artists, right, is also then had made, has made me aware that writing is in the formation of the designs and baskets the way that those baskets are formed, you know, by the mouth and the hands, that they belong in the river, that they grow in the earth, by the pottery, the designs on the pottery, by the carvings on the, on the wall, by even the fragmentation and the stones that have been remade into the cathedrals where people continue to go because they know that that's the sacred, that's where it's located because it sits on a particular land where water runs. And, you know, there's a lot, a lot of story there. And that embodiment then has remained alive in the peoples that continue to remember those things because they live in it and they utilize it. And so in terms of Sandy's work again, I think that the vision um, of continuity um, is a resistance to occupation. So we can go back again to the idea that 1521, and then we look at 2021, and we look at the policy that's been created, the colonial policy that very much still alive and very much determines, you know, how we are seen. So that when we think of uh, what Sandy is, 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 is remarking upon, the mapping, and I ran across a little note in one of Shiri Moraga's talks that said, where we put our foot down. And I thought about that idea of putting your foot down and what that means, you know, in terms of movement and how this continent and its, its, its energy has been movement, movement of knowledge. It's never been 
these isolated locations that people keep trying to convince us about so that a language like Nawat can move, you know? Um, so as artists, then I, I think as, you know, that that's been, that's been the task, right? Of, of trying to listen and, and, uh, and work with the material and allow it to speak and allow you to tell you something about what's still very much alive. Not this idea that things are gone and in the past, but that things are still present and very much alive for us. And that we then can, in a sense, recover uh, by remembering that um, we can uh, embody um, and, and therefore you know, continue to be, not to see ourselves as past and then what are we now in present, but as the continuity of those survivors of a great invasion. Um, I guess I, we, were, we mentioned, we just mentioned recovery and embodiment. And these are two points that I would like to use to circle back for a moment um, to this connection between Sandy's work and the Florentine Codex in particular. I mean, as Celia was saying, there is this enormous work that Sandy has been um, doing over the past um, years of really understanding uh, certain um, knowledges and practices and beliefs that are, are um, recorded in the Florentine Codex in particular that are crucial to understanding both that time and also um, certain artistic practices that she wants to recuperate and continue to work on today. And this made me think about something that Alison mentioned when she was um, talking about the Florentine Codex and also Felicia mentioned this um, to um, how such a particular, what a particular work it is uh, because of this connection between, I mean, this column Nahuatl, this column in Spanish that sometimes completely disappears uh, and is uh, actually replaced by images, which of course we know these paintings had a lot of meaning and also work as a text. And Sandy's work engages a lot with book 12, uh, which is about the conquest. But she also engages a lot with book 11, which is called the book of natural things. Um, and this is so interesting to me because for a long time, we have kept thinking about nature from medical plant, uh, medical treatments and healing practices and uh, what Europeans call simples, which are these plants and all these um, natural material that were used um, both for art, for art, for medicine, as exactly that things, and sort of forgot that they were truly technologies, uh, and they were really technologies that were that implied very different and very complex kinds of knowledges and practices. And um, some of these are actually absent in the Spanish text, uh, in the Florentine Codex. Um, the way feather workers or uh, artisans who work with the stones or uh, who work in metals, um, I think, I believe it says, um, is so present in the culture right now that you don't even need uh, the explanation. But of course, in now there is a very long, lengthy explanation about this, and then you have the images. Um, and this, this is crucial in understanding, I think, uh, Sandy's research project over the past year, which is about understanding, really reading through the Nahuatl text and looking at the images, the colors that the painters of the current uh, of the Florentine Codex used and understanding how these colors are created and produced, um, what these materials, how they emerge, uh, what kind of knowledges are, are necessary for, for them to actually exist. And, and then she uses it in her work. She uses amate paper, um, which is handmade. Um, she has been going through, to the desert to collect plants and understand how you transform them into artistic materials. And so there is a sense that and she has said this explicitly, that she is um, seeing herself as part of this Tlaquilo um, tradition, this um, Tlaquilo, this word that I hope you can also unpack for us and talk a little bit more, um, what it means um, involving both art and uh, writing and knowledge. So I pass it on to you with all of this, and I hope <laughs> um, you can tell us more about how you understand this Tlaquila tradition and what the importance of this recovery is in terms of um, more a material perspective, I would say, or, yeah. Yeah, I think um, picking up actually on sort of the, the very end of what Celia was saying in her prior answer, I mean, I, I think we can really sort of think about this as 
like a survival that is a resistance, right? That, that's sort of a lot of what's going on in this. And I, I, I mean, there's sort of a lot of different answers to this question about ways in which um, Sandy is sort of engaging with and sort of creating this like radical continuity that um, really in a lot of ways sort of persists despite these this history that we're talking about of colonialism and sort of, you know, like really fundamental devaluing of ways of being and ways of knowing, right? Um, the fact of survival despite that is, I mean, it's, it's powerful, right? Um, so in Sandy's case, um, I, I think a lot of this work is about sort of continuing this idea of, um, you know, the work of the Tlacuilo. So this is a Nahuatl term um, that we usually translate as um, a painter or a scribe. Um, so this comes from the Nahuatl verb Tlacuiloa. Um, it is for our linguists out there a preterite agentive. Um, so <laughs> this is this is a form um, of the verb that is someone who does this action and therefore is a performer of this action. Um, and that verb is ihqui, um, which come or ihquiloa, which is coming from ihiot, which is really breath, right? But it's also something that's done with a lot of intentionality and a lot of skill. Um, and then it's coming from this other main verb, qui, um, which is to take or also to scratch. So qui, qui, when you're reduplicating it, this is giving us this idea of sort of scratching away at something. So a tlacquilo is someone who engages a, in this action of this um, sort of very deliberate and very skillful act of scratching, right? And we have that as a description of um, the action of producing these codices. Um, so there are a lot of different dimensions to this, which I think actually I will let my, my fellow panelists delve into because I know that they have a lot of knowledge about this. Well, I'm sure we could have made like a day long panel just talking about this one word uh, <laughs> because it's, you know, I, I appreciate Allison what you're saying uh, in laying out this word Iquilo. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to point out was that uh, there's a description of what uh, 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 tlacuilo, or what, uh, what uh, tlacuilope, with the plural, uh, what they are. And in the description, it doesn't say anything about paper. Uh, and so we tend to think of, of uh, you know, one of these writers, scribe artists, as someone who works on paper and is creating these texts, these books, and, and these beautiful uh, paintings that we see, you know, for, in works like Sandy's. Um, but it, as Celia was pointing out, it exists in everything. So the, the, the carvings on, on stone sculpture, um, the embroidery on the huipiles that the, the women wore, um, all of these things were seen as examples of writing in this traditional sense. And so, uh, so what a tlacuilo is, is something that is, is, it defies kind of Western, uh, Western lines of defining what a writer is or what a painter is or what a scribe is. And so I think it really speaks to the, this whole problem that we often come across in working with indigenous traditions uh, that translations fail. Uh, and so I say that in English and I know it's getting translated into Spanish. Um, and so we have, we have English and we have Spanish and you know, they were in contact for, for quite a, a long time historically in Europe. Um, but indigenous languages and the knowledge that's embedded within those indigenous languages are so different from what we see going on with European languages and even Asian languages uh, that it it can be it can be difficult to you know as as Tlacuiloa uh, Tlacu suggests to kind of scratch away and kind of arrive at the meaning behind those uh, and so uh, I think that getting back to Sandy's work. I think it's really uh, important to think about how uh, she is she is able to continue these traditions uh, in a way that I think is very true to this tradition of the of the writing in an indigenous sense um, as something that was uh, able to kind of uh, transcend these boundaries of what uh, of what a writer is or what a painter is in in relaying these really deep and I think very powerful and very social messages and very much needed messages for our time. 
uh, in this in this way that incorporates traditional uh, traditional modes, but also brings in a lot of contemporary issues. Thank you, Felicia. And Alison, I, I would say to add to that, that maybe uh, we might look at the, you know, Telequilo as um, uh, and a sense of, uh, you know, this is probably why our Maestra Center uh, for Chicana and is, is such a long title because it's trying to say Telequilo. <laughs> it is, I think, uh, basically, I think of it as poetry. I think of it as a sense of poetry in terms of that poetry is philosophy in the sense that poetry is also speaks to the spirit, speaks to the spiritual, that there is a moment in us that is not divided up into these little boxes and categories of knowledge and learning, but that is about bringing in or making visible. I, I you know, it's, 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 the telacuilo is being prepared and having the, the dawn, you know, having the gift, right? to bring things into the world and make them visible that already exist, you know, which is why it's in the air, it's the aliento, it's the, it's the breath of life, it's sound, it's music, it's the ability to, you know, to, to see and make visible what's already in the paper, to make the pigments work in the way that they want to, to be seen, that are already there in the stone, you know, and it's also the transformation of all of those into our, into the human capacity, and that is what makes it this uh, the idea of Telequilo then uh, considering the sacred. So philosophy, poetry in the in in all aspects of, of creation. And interestingly enough, that the so-called books that were meant to be read, but really the knowledge that was meant to be released was never released alone by one person, but was actually a gathering of people that had the ability to see the stars and understand and those historians that remembered where they were at a particular time and the people that paid attention to what was happening in the society that could then bring it all together to tell us what we needed to know to move forward or to understand our circumstances. And so the work then um, that she is doing then, again, it seems, you know, here we are, maybe it gives us the impact of this pandemic to lose the elders that hold the language, the indigenous languages. We are losing the elders that are the speakers of these languages and that have so much information of this continent that is crucial to our survival. And then those that, those children removed from their families and their language and their home, their home language, how they understand the world, you know, that, uh, how do you regain those? Those are the issues that we now are facing, you know, in this moment, even though we're also then dealing with, you know, cell phone that, that bridges across so many communities and actually, you know, changes the meanings and, and the importance of the, of the moment, of the interior, uh, you know, so all of those things are happening. And I think in looking at her work of mapping and looking at how she's remarking on the historical documents and connecting you know, what it meant to be um, in the 15th, 16th century and what is happening now, you know, by linking them together in image um, is again, you know, releasing for us the impact of these moments. I think sort of one final aspect that I really appreciated in looking at Sandy's work is the way in which she's really using her, um, these, uh, you know, codices that she's producing as a way of kind of understanding the place that she's in now. Um, and I also actually see that as sort of a form of engaging with the way that we think about codices sort of functioning historically, which is really as, um, you know, material creations, but also as documents that, uh, you know, were performed aloud and were performed for a community. And I, I think that's a way of sort of thinking about these as documents that are very much, um, you know, enunciated in a specific time and place, and which actually sort of create community by virtue of, um, you know, sharing this knowledge orally. So I think, uh, you know, Sandy's doing it in like very different ways. Um, I, I think one of the things she's done that I, I find, you know, really fantastic is um, like really deep studies of uh, the 
sort of botanical uh, life, right, that exists in the different places where she has her exhibitions. So I know, um, you know, sort of engaging with the history of Santa Barbara and also its natural history has been really fundamental to the work that she's putting into the ex exhibition that will happen here in the fall. Um, so it's another way, I think, of kind of grounding um, the codex form in a particular time and place and sort of using it as a way of understanding where we are. And I, I think that's kind of a really important point to draw out as well. If, yeah, if you don't mind me, me uh, just, you know, hearing all these these different perspectives, it always just stirs up so much more for me. You know, I shared, um, I shared an image, and I know that it's, it's somewhere in, I think Rachel has, uh, has a copy of it somewhere, um, of, uh, from the Codex Teleriano Romensis, which is a mouthful, uh, that has an, an image of a woman who is a Tlaquilo, uh, and, uh, there it is. Uh, and, you know, uh, we can see that she is creating a text that appears to be a painted text. Uh, and I am of, you know, I'm of the opinion, again, I, I see writing everywhere, that what she's writing is the flower and the song, that she is writing poetry. And so that, that we see kind of two blocks and the first one being kind of a flower. And the and second, second one, one uh, uh, looking, looking to be... To be uh, and so that second part, the speech scrolls, we can see that uh, that kind of document showing up in other representations of writers in other texts. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that it, what Celia is pointing out is extremely important is that, you know, that these things, they're, they're not, they're not uh, static creations. They're not like books that are just, the words sit there uh, and they and they are written in one form and they remain in that form in perpetuity. They are meant to be cre creative texts. They're meant to be interacted with. Uh, they're meant to be performed and, and they shift over time. They not always perform the same way. It, it's not that kind of text. Uh, even though there are words embedded and there's knowledge that is absolutely thoroughly ingrained, uh, it is a flexible and, and living text in a lot of ways. I think we only have a few more minutes, but um, as you were all talking, I was trying to collect some of the threads um, that connect um, through different responses, even though there's obviously a coherence to it, but um, it made me think about, um, I mean, Stadia mentioned this issue of, of the losses, uh, right, um, of the elders. And um, Alison mentioned how um, Sandy's work is embedded in the community. Uh, and now, Felicia, you, you, you bring us this, this image of, of, of the Taquilo uh, writing. And all of these three aspects, um, for me, speak a lot about one of the issues that I guess we haven't touch as, as deeply as, as uh, I thought originally we would, which is the pandemic. Um, the pandemic because, of course, she, is, she has been thinking about amid the pandemic because it's something crucially that kind of at that moment with ours, the Florentine Codex was written as um, two pandemics were going on. Nadine Saragun um, says that he's losing everyone, um, that the College of, of Santa Cruz in Tatalogo, where he was working, had lost a lot of his Nahua scholars who were teaching there. Um, and of course, thinking about Sandy's work and how to speak to, to specific communities, these are communities that we also know the pandemic has hit harder. Um, than others, and that is these structural asymmetries uh, in the way uh, care is, um, is offered and given, uh, in the way we think about uh, our own communities and how we treat them, and in the way artists, I imagine as Sandy, is also seeing how, how um, her connection with these events really also develop as 2020 uh, happen and then 2021. So I was wondering if you have any maybe final thoughts about about these, about um, about us today here in Santa Barbara, um, uh, thinking about Sandy and thinking about the pandemic. I'll just say really briefly that you know I, I want to uh, I want to acknowledge and and 
I think uh, really take a moment to appreciate the, uh, the amount of urgency that has been maintained in indigenous communities. We see in 1521, this urgency of like uh, sharing culture, of, of recording culture, of, uh, of recording it, uh, you know, in a variety of ways as best they could uh, in order to maintain it because they did see people dying around them. They did see their elders dying. There was this, this uh, horrible time that they were living through uh, and even though they were writing it under the guidance of a Spaniard, and they probably were never going to see this text again, and then they, it was lost to them, and they didn't know what was going to be the, the fate of these texts. Uh, and luckily, now indigenous communities can then can then get a copy, and they can bring it home, and then they can they can uh, help to restore and revitalize um, a lot of these traditions and this knowledge. Uh, they were still hopeful. They had so much hope that they were willing to engage in these kinds of, uh, these kinds of recordings of, of their history. And I see that being extremely important. You know, you know I'm not in Santa Barbara right now, but uh, you know, I've, I, I lived in Santa Barbara for 10 years and I really got to know a lot of people in the Chumash community. And I see that the language revitalization that's happening now in Santa Barbara is coming largely uh, through recordings that were made no, uh, like a hundred years ago now. And so, you know, I think that we can look at these kinds of models of the, of the dedication of our, of our ancestors, of our indigenous ancestors, and, uh, and we, can, we can carry on this kind of dedication that we see in Sandy's work of recording, of, of uh, sharing our indigenous knowledge, our indigenous heritage with the hope that while these are difficult times, that it will serve as a guide for future generations in helping us work through these difficult times. I thank you for that, Felicia. I think that is so that um, that the strength of prayer or keeping the spirit alive, right? It, it is it is remarking on who came before us. It's acknowledging that we're, we're connected to each other. Um, I, but, you know, I wanted to mention that right now there's a, a struggle uh, to protect the Ortega Street murals in Santa Barbara, a series of murals that are, you know, over, I think they're done since the 70s to now. And um, there's a park gentrification happening in Santa Barbara. And so the murals are just being looked at as, you know, objects of art, you know whether um, and, uh, and evaluated, you know, on their, you know, from a sort of West Eurocentric perspective as to whether they're valuable to keep. And I think the understanding that, that has to be built is that they are, they are a cultural, um, they're markers, they're folks uh, sort of embodying culture and, uh, and they are very hopeful in the sense that they, uh, you know, make place um, they give vision to young people. They give vision to a sense of community, of existence and continued existence. So the murals are more than just paintings or objects. They're actually, you know, sort of in, an aspect of culture. And so this is something that uh, that is a, that's a con right now in struggle. Um, and we have to, um, you know, have a conversation with uh, with the city council um, as to what the value is of that. And I think it's the same thing, you know, with our um, in our com in the indigenous communities, our communities, um, in in realizing what matters and what you know what needs to be continually practiced and kept alive. Uh, so I I think the communities have been very uh, very busy in doing so, and uh, and right now challenged also um, as to where our attention should be and and uh, and what do we need to do as 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 cultural workers as artists as as folks, you know, to support the continuity of all of these cultures that we are now, you know, all engaged in because we, there are so many cultures present. So um, I think that's the that's the work, and I think that's the meaning of Sandy's work coming to the to the museum in terms of her own practice is that she's then allowing us to to see ourselves, right? To see ourselves and see what's here. And, and, and engage in that conversation in the same way that you just spoke about those, um, uh, you know, Amate books being released. You know, sometimes I think about some, I think the Huichol folks have songs that are something like 14 days long. I mean, the song is 14 days long. And I think about what it takes to remember that 
and, and the energy to be able to enact it. And so I, I know that there's a lot of strength, you know, within the work itself that's still in that work. And I think Sandy's work uh, represents that, that same strength and that same embodiment. I don't think we probably could find better words to wrap up this discussion table. I don't know if Alison, you want to say, to add anything? I think Celia, that was beautiful, yep. Yes, exactly. So I think um, with these, we can probably um, um, finish the round table. Uh, again, thank you so much to all of you for, uh, for, for sharing with us today and to the audience. And I'm gonna pass it on to Rachel. Um, Sandy says thank you for all for a brilliant conversation and I completely agree thank you all so much for being so willing to participate and share your wisdom and knowledges um, with our group as we start this um, year of contemplation uh, around our history and our present uh, so thank you so much and thank you to all of our attendees and all of our collaborators and interpreters it's been a, a a good group effort. I appreciate it. So take care, everybody.